Good morning, everyone. Welcome. My name is Jordan, and I'm the Manager of Online Education Programs at COSI. Thank you very much for joining us today for the 2021 COSI Science Festival. As you know, we've moved from a four-day physical festival to an all-digital format. Uh, today um, is the final day of our events, but we are looking forward to joining for you to join us tomorrow. Uh, we hope you, that you will connect virtually with at-home science activities and share those experiences uh, with photos or videos using social media, uh, using hashtag COSI SciFest. We look forward to seeing all those pictures and videos of the activities that you do at home. Of course, we wanna give a big shout out to all of our sponsors and partners of the Science Festival science festival, especially our visionary sponsor, Battelle. We certainly could not have done this without them. And if you would like to show your support for COSI, we have once again been nominated for USA Today's 10 Best Science Museum. You can vote for COSI by visiting COSI.org slash 10 best and uh, view, vote for your support there. Don't forget that COSI opens to the public again on June 3rd. We are very excited to have you back here in our building. And before we get to our event today, we have a very special message from COSI's president and CEO, Dr. Frederick Berkeley, and some very special guests. I'll turn it over to him. Welcome everyone to the 2021 COSI Science Festival. This is one of our signature events where we bring science to where you live, learn, and lounge. And as we like to say at COSI, science is truly everywhere and for everyone. Throughout today and the entire science festival, you will see examples of how STEM degrees are part of many different career paths. COSI is thrilled to have Ohio's Lieutenant Governor Houston and Chancellor of Higher Education Gardner join us today to hear about science, technology, engineering, and math, otherwise known as STEM, right here in the great state of Ohio and beyond. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Chancellor Randy Gardner, who is the Chancellor of the Ohio Department of Higher Education. Chancellor Gardner oversees the state's two and four-year colleges and universities and Ohio Technical Centers. Additionally, the Chancellor provides policy guidance for the Governor and the Ohio General Assembly and carries out state higher education policy. Thank you for being with us, Chancellor Gardner. Well, thank you very much. What an honor it is to be at this, uh, really the celebration of science, the celebration of STEM education. Uh, you know, STEM education leads to STEM careers, great job opportunities, in-demand fields that are really important, not only to Ohio, but to all of this country. Um, what I love about Choose Ohio First, the Choose Ohio First Scholarship Program in Ohio, um, is it really provides opportunities in a variety of different types of colleges and universities. We just had a, a recent announcement with 57 different colleges in Ohio and universities participating in this program from two-year community colleges to four-year public universities and four-year private or independent uh, colleges and universities all throughout the state. And they had one thing in common. They wanted to elevate STEM education. They wanted to provide new opportunities uh, for students to learn these uh, skills and these disciplines and to participate in our great uh, economy in Ohio. So what I like to think about in Ohio is we have a great diversity of opportunity in the STEM fields. And clearly that is something that Ohio has been, been stronger at every year. And we've taken it to another level uh, here in 2021. You know, our the DeWine Houston administration um, really has focused on workforce-based issues, uh, student-centered, uh, the governor and lieutenant governor are working very closely with the General Assembly to advance these issues. But I've been around the State House for about 35 years, and I've never seen an administration more focused on these kinds of issues. And no one more focused than Lieutenant Governor John Houston. I first knew John Houston when he was a member of the General Assembly. And it was actually John Houston as Speaker of the House who proposed the Choose Ohio First Scholarship in the state budget. And so he had the vision, he had the foresight that this was going to be important, not only then, but continuing and becoming even more important every year uh, in our state. Uh, he is uh, leading our efforts on STEM education, on workforce, on innovation, on technology. Uh, there's really no Lieutenant Governor who's done more uh, for Ohio uh, already in his short tenure than John Houston. So it's my honor uh, to uh, introduce uh, to everyone, not only in Ohio, but throughout the country, Lieutenant Governor John Houston. Lieutenant Governor? 
Thank you, Chancellor Gardner. You know, I appreciate the accolades about the vision that I had when I was Speaker of the House of making Ohio a leader in STEM, but we've been leading in STEM since Thomas Edison and the Wright brothers, all right? So we, we go way back on this. And, and uh, in Ohio, we offer scholarships for Ohio students to major in STEM, uh, in STEM education. Uh, look, it, it, is, it is really important. Why? because we know that businesses need STEM talent. We know that the jobs of the future are gonna grow faster if you major in STEM. We know that the jobs are not only available, but they pay more when you major in STEM. And let's face it, uh, the hottest topics of the day uh, in our world are STEM. Mars Perseverance, the COVID vaccine, uh, broadband expansion, we even have something amazing that's going on. We created three innovation districts in Ohio focused on, on everything from pediatric cancer to, to genetics to the study of viruses. And Ohio is going to be one of the first places in the world, it's actually going to be the first place in the world, that IBM puts a quantum computer uh, outside of the lab to focus on real-world solutions in healthcare. We are leading educationally, economically, uh, in, in our state, and we're only beginning. Uh, we're really focusing uh, on computer science, uh, on healthcare, uh, and engineering, mathematics, and all that is connected to that. So we know it's the future, uh, and the future depends on educating that workforce of the future, uh, and to create the opportunities for Ohioans, either who are here or who will come here to go to college and go to work. Uh, and we want to be. Uh, the leading state in the Midwest at driving this change. And I believe we are with even a brighter future lying ahead. So whether it's the Choose Ohio for a scholarship, whether it's early college in our, in our uh, high schools, uh, you name it, we're, we're leading the way. And um, it's only the beginning. I am so excited about what Governor DeWine and I have planned for the future. We have a team at Innovate Ohio who are focusing on the next innovations and the next great things. But I have to come back to this. None of this can happen without amazing talent. We didn't come up with COVID vaccines without amazing talent in STEM. We're not you know, seeing live pictures essentially from Mars right now because of, uh, we're, we're seeing that because of great STEM educators and, uh, and great STEM talent. And we look forward uh, to continuing to lead on in this way into the future. And we've got a great partner in COSI doing amazing things to help young people uh, get a great start in Ohio. And we couldn't be more excited about our future. Well, thank you very much, Lieutenant Governor Houston and Chancellor Gardner for talking with us about STEM education and just being so excited about why this field is so important. The festival highlights many subject areas that students can choose their Ohio, their Choose Ohio First project in, as you heard from Chancellor Gardner. And you can also become that scientist that solves the next great challenges that Lieutenant Governor outlined, like the man and woman mission to Mars, or even developing that next world-saving vaccine. So please visit us at www.cosci-sci-fest.org. Again, that's cosci-sci-fest.org to check out more events and visit Ohio's in-demand job list to check out the STEM career opportunities for all of you, regardless of age and regardless of status in life. There's a world of opportunities for you. Now, we will see, <clears throat> pardon me. Now, we will see a live tour of the Arabidopsis Biological Resource Center at Ohio State, showcasing researchers who work on seed and DNA production. You'll learn about a common weed that serves as an important model system for plant science research and get a behind the scenes look at the Ohio State University's greenhouse, growth chambers, robots, and more. Can't wait to see you there. All right, I think, I think I'm live. Um, hello everybody, I am Courtney Price. I'm the Education and Outreach Specialist for the Arabidopsis Biological Resource Center. And we are located on West Campus um, at Ohio State University. 
Obviously, you can tell I'm currently located in my home office, but we're excited to share with you the facilities that we have um, that help us to share plant science with the world. So I'm going to first introduce Arabidopsis to you. Um, so the technical, the scientific name for Arabidopsis is Arabidopsis thaliana. Most people don't really know about it. Um, it's a common weed. If you look at the pictures I have here, it's probably something that you've seen growing in the sidewalk cracks or it looks very similar to something you've seen um, and possibly picked out of your garden. And while it is a weed to, um, you know, in everyday life and science, it's very important. And I want to tell you why. So Arabidopsis is what we call a model system. And I like to say that um, Arabidopsis is to plant science, what the mouse is to medical research. So it is a simple system that researchers can use to learn all different kinds of things about flowering plants in general and about agriculturally important crops. Um, and they can apply the knowledge that they gain from studying Arabidopsis out into other systems. And so it's very easy to grow. It has a quick life cycle. So it goes from a planted seed to a seed producing plant in about six to eight weeks. It doesn't require a lot of space. Um, and interestingly, Arabidopsis was the first plant to have its genome completely sequenced. And that happened about 21 years ago. And so what that means is that scientists were able to unlock all the secrets of its DNA, of the instructions that tell the Arabidopsis plant how to grow. And so we know a lot of things about this specific species of plant um, that help us to study it and to learn a lot of new things. And on the screen now are some photos, some examples of other model systems that are also used in research. I just wanted to give a quick shout out to the entire Arabidopsis Biological Resource Center team. We call ourselves ABRC for short. So that's what I'm gonna use moving forward. And today you're going to hear from three different people. So you'll hear from me. I'm going to start our virtual tour here in just a moment. You're going to hear from Chris Calhoun, who is a curator and in charge of seed production and quality control. And then we have Emma Nee, who is our fearless associate director, and she does a lot of work in our DNA uh, lab. So let's see if I can if this is going to work perfectly for me. All right, so, oh, it didn't take that. Hold on just a second. I'm gonna stop sharing and then reshare so that you're on the same page as me. Just a second here, sorry. I knew I'd have technical difficulties. That's kind of how I roll when it comes to presenting virtually. I think we're all still just learning how this world works. Okay. Let's see. There we go. Okay. So this is the outside of our space on West Campus. It's nice to see it. Um, we call this building the biotech support facility. And it includes the greenhouses and growth chambers and some different spaces where the ABRC and many other researchers on campus uh, grow our plants. And I'm going to take you inside and just kind of walk you through a day in the life of an Arabidopsis seed and an Arabidopsis scientist. And so the first thing that people need to do as they start to prepare their plants is to prepare the soil. And different plants have different needs in terms of soil, moisture, and nutrients. This is our soil prep room. It's obviously, you know, it's not very exciting to look at. But one thing that is important about soil prep room is that it's a seed-free zone. And so no one is supposed to bring any seeds into this space. This is purely for preparing the soil. So we will take our soil in there, mix it up, get it to the correct moisture level, add the appropriate nutrients, and then take it elsewhere to plant our um, seeds because we don't want to potentially contaminate someone else's research by bringing seeds of one strain or another or even different species of plants into this space um, because the Arabidopsis seeds are so very small, it'd be really easy to accidentally um, have them blow away or get into a soil that would end up in another experiment and potentially contaminate it. So from the soil prep room, then we'll bring our materials into one of the planting spaces. And so this room is the place where I most generally plant my seeds when I'm growing for programs. 
And you can see here we have a planting station set up. So I'll give you a close up view of that. So I mentioned that Arabidopsis seeds are very small. Um, I have a vial here with me at home of them, but I don't really think, there you go. So this little teeny tiny vial has about 100 seeds and they're just down there in the bottom, the little brown. Um, so they're very small. And so when you plant them, you don't actually like insert them under the soil like you would with a larger seed, like a sunflower seed in your garden. Instead, you just put them right on top of the soil. And so if you're planting just a few, say in the bigger pots that you see here, you would put some water into a dish and individually pick up the seeds with the pipettes that you see. If you're planting a larger number of seeds like you would with the, the other flat here that you see, then you would pour out your quantity, however many you want, and like gently sprinkle them across the soil. Um, we always water our Arabidopsis plants from the bottom, which is why they're in those trays, because if we would put the water on top, the seeds are so small that they would easily wash away or the seedlings could be damaged. So that's kind of step two in the process. We prepared our soil, we planted our seeds, and now we would place our pots either in a growth chamber or a greenhouse. So I'm going to take you to our greenhouse first. And it has a set of double doors. So right now we're inside our first door. We're getting ready to go through the second set of doors. This is similar to if you've ever been to an aviary at the zoo and you always have to enter that first set, let the doors close and go through the other. And we do this not because our Arabidopsis plants are gonna fly away, but if there are any pests or uh, pathogens that could make the plants sick, um, we don't want to potentially bring anything in or let anything come out that wouldn't be healthy for our plants. So this is just one of those systems that help us to be in control of the environment a little bit more. So this is our greenhouse, a great place to go on a sunny day. Um, you may notice as I'm giving you a, a view around that it's pretty empty. Now we took this video last summer and even though Arabidopsis is a weed and it's easy to grow, it cannot handle the heat that builds up in the greenhouse in Ohio summers. And so typically we don't do any growing of Arabidopsis in this space in the summer. And unfortunately, that's when I took my, my photos. However, I do have some pictures I can show you what it would look like. And so what you see here is one of the rooms planted out with a variety of different strains. And when I say strains, it just means different types, um, different varieties. So these pots all have different strains of Arabidopsis in them. They're seedlings. Well, we call this the rosette stage. So it has a whole bunch of leaves, but not a lot of other things going on right now. And then as the plants start to develop, they will grow this flower stalk that you may be able to see. Uh, we'll get an up close view of that later. And also here we are with some um, some other flowering plants and you can see the sleeves that we put around them and those are flower sleeves that you would get say if you went to the grocery store and bought a bouquet of flowers and you can put your flowers down into that but the way that we use them is to prevent cross-contamination and so in these plantings that you see here each pot has a different strain of Arabidopsis so what's in pot one is a little bit different than pot two and it's important for us as a business to make sure that none of the seeds get mixed up because we're sending these out to researchers all over the globe. And when researchers order a sample of seeds from us, they want to be sure that it's a, a pure sample, that it just has the seeds of the plant that they ordered. And so these sleeves prevent the seeds from one plant to make it over into another sample. Interestingly, Arabidopsis is self-pollinated. So we're not so much concerned about the pollen from one plant transferring to another, because by the time that the Arabidopsis uh, flowers open, they've already been pollinated by themselves. So it's really just about seed transfer and we wanna prevent that. And that's what these sleeves help us to do. And then I wanna show you the next picture here. And so when it's harvest time in our greenhouse, um, really it just looks like we're growing a bunch of dead plants. And that's because as we get closer to the time when we want to harvest the seeds, it's much easier to gather the seeds from dry, dead plant material than you know, vibrant, moist plants. And so we actually stop watering the plants and let them dry out for about two weeks before we just process the plant material and gather the seeds. And so that's what you see here. 
And then when it is time for us to gather the seeds, we just cut off all the plant material and then kind of crush it up and run it through a fine mesh so that the debris from the plant, the stems and the flower, you know, any uh, leftover flowers and leaves will be sorted out and the small tiny seeds will fall through. Now I mentioned that we don't grow during the summer. Typically for our business, um, we grow about twice a year, usually a spring and a fall planting. And each time we'll plant around 3000 different strains of Arabidopsis. So three, something, something's different about each one of those 3000 types. So why do we do this? And I think I skipped that in the beginning. So our job as the ABRC, we're one of two global stock centers for Arabidopsis. And what that means is when people find a new type of Arabidopsis or create a mutation in the lab um, that makes a new unique strain, our goal is to collect those from researchers so that we can propagate them. So if it's a seed, then we'll try to grow the plant and collect more seeds. If it's a DNA resource, then we'll work in the DNA lab. And then we maintain them. We keep them um, alive and healthy so that as researchers around the world want to continue to research Arabidopsis and want to build on you know, previous um, discoveries, they can order from us these seeds and we'll ship them out around the world. Um, it's also something that's used a lot by teachers. And so teachers can order Arabidopsis seeds to use in their classroom. So at this point, I'm gonna take us over to our other building, just check in to see if there's any questions or comments. We are gonna have a Q&A time at the end if we don't talk too much. And so if, you if you're watching and you have a question or a comment that you wanna make, we'll try to address that um, at the end of the program. So the building you see now is Wrightmeyer Hall, and this is where the rest of the Arabidopsis Biological Resource Center facilities are located. So we're gonna head inside, and I'm gonna show you one part, and then I'm gonna um, pass the baton to one of my coworkers. So the part that I wanted to show you was a growth chamber room. So we saw the greenhouse, um, and greenhouses allow you a modest amount of control over your growing cycle. Um, you obviously, you can't control the sunlight, but you have your plants enclosed in a space where you can monitor and control pests and pathogens, which are like plant diseases a little bit better, um, more so than you could if you're planting in the field. Growth chambers are the next step from that, where it allows you an even higher level of control over your experiment and over your growing conditions. And that's what I'm showing you here. And so I'm going to show you the insides of a few of these growth chambers, and you can see um, what some of our plants look like in different stages. So let's start here with growth chamber five. And what you see here in growth chamber five is what we call a germination test. And so as a business that provides resources to scientists around the world, it's important for us to know that we have high quality seeds that are going to germinate and grow um, when they are planted. And so with a germination test, uh, we have Petri dishes and we place filter paper in the bottom. Uh, we wet it with distilled water and then we place a known amount of seeds on the filter paper, seal it up and put it in a growth chamber with you know, appropriate lighting and temperature. So let's say that we had put 100 seeds in each of these Petri dishes. And so what we're going to do over the course of you know, a week or so is to see how many of those seeds actually started to grow. Um, our goal, what we consider a good germination rate is 81% or higher. So if we planted 100 seeds, we'd want to see 81, 81 of those seeds or more actually growing um, as we would expect. If it's less than that, then we'll have to perhaps regrow that plant and see if we can create a higher quality seed through different growing conditions and quality control measures. So that's what we have in this one. Let's see what's in our next greenhouse. So we're gonna visit growth chamber number four, and you can see we have some mature plants here. And so Arabidopsis, I don't think I mentioned this earlier, but it is in the Brassica family, which is actually related to a lot of common crops. A lot of vegetables that you probably eat at home broccolis and cauliflowers cabbage and radish 
Um, and there's a lot of different types of plants in this family. This plant that you're seeing here is not actually a, um, a Arabidopsis plant. It's uh, within the same family. Arabidopsis has a six to eight growing week growing cycle, as I mentioned. The plants that you see here have actually been growing for about 32 weeks, so a much slower uh, life cycle. And um, again, these pictures were taken last summer. So these plants are about ready for harvest, for seed to get the seeds um, about a week after the photo was taken. Two more growth chambers to show you. You can see here, now this is um, Arabidopsis here in this growth chamber, and we have it growing in two different kind of life stages. The photo I just opened up for you, and I don't know if you can really see it depending on how big your computer screen is, these are seedlings that are about five days old. They do germinate and start to grow relatively quickly. And if you are able to see it, there are some really tiny little seedlings. Most of them just have two leaves visible. Those are called their cotyledons or seed leaves. And a few of them are just starting to get their second set of leaves or their true leaves. And then this next picture, which is of the, the flat that you see straight on, these are plants that are a bit older. These are about five weeks old. And um, I think I mentioned this term earlier, but this is called the rosette stage. So that kind of clump of leaves at the base of the soil, that's called a rosette. All right, let's go look at something that's a little different from plants. All right, um, this is yet another growth chamber. It looks a little different. It's actually divided into two smaller compartments. And what we have on bottom here is a cell culture shaker. I have a little video of it. And you can see that it's just constantly kind of wiggling around, jiggling around so that the fluid inside of it is moving. And what that is, is, let me see if I start that again about pause it so you can get a close up look. Here we go. What you see there is individual Arabidopsis cells, lots of them, that are suspended in a medium. And the medium is just like a liquid that provides nutrients, so like food to feed the plant cells and it promotes cell division so that those individual Arabidopsis cells are just multiplying as they're in there. Now the green that you see is the chlorophyll that's located inside the chloroplast. And the reason it's on the shaker is because that movement is constantly adding air into the system so that it's aerating it, uh, which is necessary for it to grow. The lights within the chamber provide all the energy that's needed. And every week or so, we take a portion of the cell culture and we'll transfer it into a new medium. And in this way, we essentially have an indefinitely growing and dividing um, population of Arabidopsis cells that we can provide to researchers. Now, you might think, well, you have all the seeds and all the plants. Why would someone want just a cell? Um, some experiments are easier to conduct on a simpler system. And so looking at an individual cell is much simpler than looking at a, an entire plant that has different tissue types and different functions. And so if a researcher may want to simplify their experimental design using the cell culture. So at this point, I'm going to take us back out to the hallway and I am going to pass the tour off to my coworker, Chris Calhoun. Okay. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Calhoun. I'm a curator at ABRC. I work on the seed side of ABRC. Um, so what we're going to be showing you today is a, a couple of different rooms where we handle the seeds. Um, you can see here, uh, this is our dry room. Um, it's named that because we do control the environmental conditions in this room. Um, so after the, Courtney showed you the harvesting process in the greenhouse. So after those seeds are harvested, we bring them into this dry room where we maintain the humidity between 20 and 30% relative humidity. Uh, and that allows us to dry the seeds down. The reason we do that is because we wanna make sure that the seeds hit a certain level of moisture within the seed for proper long-term storage. So we're looking at getting the seed down to five to 6% of the seeds weight being water. Um, once we've reached that and we check that by doing a test, then we can properly store that seed in a cold room at lower temperature for an extended period of time. Now we'll get to the cold room and see that in a little bit, but 
in the dry room here, we have a couple of different things I just want to briefly go over. We see here there's a microscope. Um, we do visually check every stock that's harvested. Uh, we're looking for fungal contamination. We're also looking for pests because we do send these seeds to other places outside of the United States. We have to make sure that we're not introducing any um, pests or pathogens into an, another environment where they, they may not be common. So we have to make sure that we're not introducing those there. Uh, you can also see uh, the germination test set up here is where we also prepare those. Um, so we don't test every line that's planted. We test a certain percentage to make sure that we're giving quality seeds. If we start to see some germination issues, we will test more. But so not all the stocks are tested for germination, but they are visually inspected. So next we're gonna move out to the front part of the dry room here. Um, so this is where we prepare orders and also where we transfer seeds to vials um, for storage. Uh, Courtney's going to click on the picture here. So what you see here is our setup for transferring the seeds from the envelopes that you see to vials. So each envelope has a stock number on it, which also contains a barcode. We use those barcodes to track the stocks, basically from the time that they're donated to ABRC through their entire life cycle and distributed to users. Um, we use that barcode to record information so we can always go back and reference that information for anything that may come up. So we produce vials for us at ABRC, and then we also work with in collaboration with a stock center in the UK. So we will also send them seeds at this point as well. Now you can see here, this is actually preparing orders by hand. Uh, we do prepare orders in two ways. We can aliquot them by hand. Um, and how we do that is you see these little scoops here. These are all custom made scoops. We use a syringe of the plunger from a syringe and we um, manipulate that to where we can get a little scoop at the end. And then we've estimated the number of seeds that we can send. Uh, typically when we do send an order, we send 100 seeds, but we have some various different size scoops depending on what we're doing. We may actually need to use a larger size. So that's where we do all that stuff here. Um, next, I believe we're going to go to the robot. Now this is what we've got. Uh, we got this robot through an equipment grant from the National Science Foundation. Um, and this is primarily what we use now to um, distribute orders to the users. The primary reason we got this robot uh, was we do make large sets that, so each set can contain, some of the larger ones have up to 6,000 different stocks per set. Um, and that would take us a year to do by hand. So we got the robot and with the robot, we were able to get that down to three to four months per set. So greatly increased our efficiency. So Courtney's gonna play the video here so you can actually see how the robot works and I'll talk through it as we go. So we load the robot and we have a computer where we use a spreadsheet to tell the robot what to do. So now the robot's going to take the cap off of the tube. It's going to move it to a distribution position and there's a needle here that goes into acetone to be cleaned. And this does this in between each stock so we don't worry about cross-contamination between the different stocks. Now the robot's going to load a distribution tube. So this is what will be sent to the researcher. So it loads it into the rotating indexer. Now the needle measures the height of the seed so it knows how far to go into the tube to pick up the seed. A vacuum turns on. It picks up the seed, it vibrates to shake any excess seed off of the needle, and then it goes over the tube, cuts off the vacuum and distributes the seed into the tube. And then it will, this is going to cap that tube. Now it's gonna be picked up and moved in front of an inkjet printer and it prints the stock number on each tube. Then it goes to the output rack and then it'll just repeat the process. It will over and over for each stock that we send. And we typically run the robot every day. Um, like I said, it's primarily what we use to do orders now. Um, there are occasions where we still have to do hand aliquoting, but for orders, most of the time, the stuff that we're doing is done on the robot. Um, so next we'll head to the cold room. So this is a cold room. Uh, again, most of the, like, just like the dry room, the, what the purpose of this room is, is in the title. So this is a room that's maintained at four degrees Celsius. Um, the seeds are stored at that temperature to promote 
longevity. Uh, we have stocks in this room that we've had since 1999 or even earlier uh, that still have good germination. So in this room, um, there are over 500,000 different Arabidopsis lines. Uh, so when we get orders, we get to download them from a database and we print out a list uh, that was what you can see in the picture here. From that list, then we will go to the drawer. We'll pull out that drawer. So each one of these drawers contains three different boxes. Within each box, there's 100 different stocks. So from the list, we'll pull the appropriate stock. We'll put it in a tray, and then we'll take that list um, back, and then we'll run, run things on the robot based on that. So this room, like I said, is at four degrees Celsius, but we also maintain it at between 20 to 30% relative humidity. Since we've prepared the seeds and dried them down to that five to six percent moisture content, we wanna make sure that we maintain that so the seeds remain viable longer. So anytime that the seeds are stored somewhere or the vials are going to be open, we wanna make sure that they're opened in that 20 to 30% relative humidity range so that way the seeds don't rapidly absorb moisture. And then when they go back into the cold room, get damaged and then aren't as viable. Now, this is one of the cold rooms that we have. We actually have another one that is off site that looks identical to this. And it has the, where we keep all of our backups. So that is a fail safe in case something was to happen to this cold room or this building. So where we would lose these stocks, we have an off site facility that has backups for all of these. And also with working in collaboration with the stocks there in the UK, if something was to happen, they also have all the same stocks that we do. And we share resources back and forth between the two. So that also adds acts as an additional backup as well. I believe that covers everything on the seed side. So now I'm going to turn it over to Emma Nee, who's going to talk about the DNA side. Hello, I'm Emma Nee. I'm the um, Associate Director of the Arabidopsis Biological Resource Centre and I've, I've worked at the centre for about 20 years now. Um, welcome to the DNA Lab. The DNA Lab actually looks more like a microbiology lab because all of our DNA samples are stored in a host, a special helper organism that um, allows us to handle short pieces of DNA rather than dealing with the entire Arabidopsis genome. So the first thing you see when you walk in the door is this giant um, freezer. Oops, now we're at the, uh, so the freezer is right in front of us here. Um, that freezer is kept, it's an ultra low freezer at um, minus 70 to minus 80 centigrade. And we can keep our um, DNA samples in their um, bacterial host in that freezer for for many, many years, 20 years or more. Um, most of the strains that we use um, as hosts to handle our DNA samples are bacteria. Bacteria um, E. coli, a disarmed strain, is the most common strain that we use. That means it's not um, pathogenic to people. It grows at um, human body temperature, so 37 Celsius, and we need a, a special incubator in order to do that. The incubator, similar to the one that we use for um, cell cultures, shakes the culture um, in order to aerate it and allow the bacteria to grow. So we have test tubes inside that shaking incubator with a bacterial culture each bacteria will be maintaining a small piece of the Arabidopsis DNA, maybe a single gene or a short stretch of a chromosome. Um, and as the bacteria is um, growing and producing new cells, it's also producing new little segments of the Arabidopsis gene that we can then harvest from the bacteria and use for our analysis. Um, we're now gonna go look at um, where the bacteria is handled. Um, we have these two um, bacterial culture hoods. They are um, isolation cabinets, which basically means that 
Um, and any bacteria that you're handling inside the cabinet cannot get out. Any bacteria or other um, microbes in the air of the lab or on the person cannot get in. So inside the cabinet, um, we have vials that contain bacteria. We have petri plates where we can streak out the bacteria to look at individual colonies. Each colony would be derived from a single bacterial cell and will have um, one Arabidopsis clone or piece of DNA in it. Um, we use uh, a pipette man that you can see on the side and disposable pipette tips to handle that. As I mentioned, the bacteria is not pathogenic, but these um, cabinets are designed for containment for the protection of the, the user um, and also for the protection of the culture to make sure that it, it stays pure and that we have a known piece of Arabidopsis DNA inside that culture. The, um, the cabinet on the left has our liquid handling robot in. It's a less sophisticated robot than our seed robot, but just as useful. It allows us to handle large numbers of um, bacterial samples, each one containing a, a separate little piece of Arabidopsis DNA at one time. And so we use special um, culture plates that have either 96 or 384 individual little wells. And, and this robot can either pipette or use tiny pins to transfer a, a tiny amount of that culture to a new plate for us to grow new cultures um, without a person having to do that repetitive task that can um, be very boring for them and also lead to them making mistakes. Moving on from our culture hoods, we have um, this, this is a separate kind of herd. This one again now is not for isolation and protection of the worker. This is just for protection of the cultures within the herd. And you can see that that is actually our Arabidopsis cell culture in there. Because it requires handling in a sterile environment, we don't want things like yeast and bacteria growing on that nutrient medium that we're providing for the plant cells. We handle that in the DNA lab where we're trained in sterile technique. Um, so here we have um, the cell culture that you saw in the shaking incubator um, alongside in the growth chambers, ready to be um, subcultured or um, transferred into a new new culture medium. The flask on the left has the, the one week old culture and then the flask on the right has new liquid medium. We'll take a small amount and transfer the culture into that. And this, container, we'll be very careful, we'll flame our instruments, we'll clean everything with alcohol, and it maintains a sterile environment so that our culture remains pure um, and we don't have any unwanted microbes growing in there. Next to the hood where we prepare those cell cultures, we have a station where we can analyze the DNA from our bacterial cultures. Um, we There are, there are special um, DNA prep kits that we use to isolate the DNA sample with the Arabidopsis gene from the bacterial culture. Um, we then use gel electrophoresis to separate different pieces of DNA. And it, it's on a gel like it sounds. It's just like jello, a little slab of, of a, a gel that um, we use electricity to allow the DNA to move through the gel and the different sized pieces of DNA move at different rates. We have a fluorescent dye attached to the DNA, which then allows us to um, view it um, using a special camera and light setup. I don't know how easily you can see this, but this example just shows a picture of a lab notebook where we've done an analysis of the DNA. We've, we've taken those um, clones, those Arabidopsis DNA fragments from the bacteria, purified them, cut them, run them on the gel, and, and taking pictures to show the individual little pieces. We also have on the sides of the gel markers with known um, sizes, and then we can analyze our DNA that way. So I think that this concludes our tour of the DNA facility. I'm really happy that we had the opportunity to to share it and um, all of our other facilities with you today. Um, and I guess we can take any questions if people have questions or comments that, that they would 
like to ask. Yeah, so I've got my eye on the comment section and I don't see anything popping up quite yet. So just a reminder that if there's something you want to ask um, us about Arabidopsis or about um, our, our roles, our science careers, you're welcome to enter that. Um, so I have a couple questions to get started. We heard at the beginning of the program from Lieutenant Governor and Chancellor Gardner um, about STEM education and STEM careers. So I thought it might be nice to share with our audiences kind of what each of our backgrounds um, is in our in our career path. So Emma, I'm going to put you on the spot. And um, do you mind starting? No, I think that's a great idea. So um, I was always interested in, in plant science from a young age, and I actually moved to Ohio for graduate work. Um, so I came to the Ohio State University actually to, to do my PhD um, and ended up staying here and um, finding a position with the Arabidopsis Biological Resource Center. My career path has been somewhat chopped up because I also have a family and I've taken some breaks in my career to to work with my family but in, in some ways actually that made me more interested in the education aspect of you know telling people what we do and educating people as I attempted to explain to my well my family in general but also you know the younger members of my family what exactly is it that mom does in the lab so I think I'm a good example of somebody who came to Ohio State you know for the for the opportunities for the education and then stayed for the STEM opportunities that there are at the university um, to work and, and also um, share with other people um, the, the re research, the science that you're doing. Awesome. How about you, Chris? Um, so uh, I've always been kind of interested in plants. Um, when I first started taking my degree at or classes at Ohio State, uh, I was a biology major. Um, and I kind of focused in plant or minored in plant biology. Um, so I got my BS in biology. Um, I graduated in 2005. I went and worked another job for a year. Uh, then I applied for a position at ABRC in 2006. Um, I started as a research assistant um, working in the seed lab, uh, primarily working with orders and greenhouse work uh, from there. I moved into a position where I focused primarily on quality control for the seed lab. Um, so that involved the germination testing and uh, the different quality control things that we do here at ABRC. And then from there, I moved to the curator position where I kind of oversee all the reproduction. So all the growing of the Arabidopsis and continue to oversee the quality control. Um, so I've been at ABRC for 13, almost 14 years now. Um, and so, again, um, my entire time has been at Ohio State, basically. So went to Ohio State for my degree and then, and then got the position uh, thereafter. Um, so that's been kind of my path. Awesome. Um, for me, I, of us, I'm the, the newbie to the group. I've been at ABRC about five and a half years. Uh, my my academic background, I have a bachelor's in wildlife biology and a master's in zoology. So I always, um, I grew up saying I wanted to be Jack Hanna, for those of you who know who Jack Hanna is, but I um, always had a strong focus on animals, but I did do some work with plants when I was in school. I took an um, international trip to Brazil to study plants there, and then also had an internship in California working in a greenhouse in the desert. Um, and then I've always, even though I studied the sciences, I've always worked as a science educator. Um, I worked for a long time at the Columbus Zoo. Um, I've worked for a local school district. I worked for COSI. And then um, after COSI, I came to Ohio State. Um, and really, my passion is sharing science and curiosity with the community, with students, with everybody um, from, you know, preschoolers to grandmas. And so whether I'm talking about animals or conservation or plants, I just helping people to get excited and see themselves in science has kind of been my, my focus. Um, one thing I think is awesome about the ABRC is we have people from all schooling levels. I think sometimes when you think about the sciences, you might default to the idea that you have to have a PhD to be kind of an active 
part of the science enterprise. And we have everyone from high school um, interns and staff, people who come to work as, with us as high school interns, undergraduate students, people with bachelor's degrees, masters, and then PhDs. And I think that's um, it's an important point when you talk about STEM is that not everyone needs to have a PhD to be involved. Um, I'm not seeing that we have, oh, okay. We do have one question. Are there careers in the field that don't require a college degree? I'm gonna default to Emma for that question. So all of the people that currently work for us as permanent staff do have a college degree. And it certainly helps, I think, if you're in that research lab environment. But as Courtney mentioned, we, we also do have um, undergraduate students that work with us. We have um, high school interns that work with us. Um, and so, it, so a degree is preferable, but you, know, you can get on the job training um, by either volunteering or doing an internship in, in a lab like ours. And I would say that the experience can, to some extent, substitute for the degree, but a degree is, is generally preferable. Another question just came in on what advice would you give someone interested in pursuing a career in the field? So I'll start with this one and then we'll go to Chris to give Emma a chance to take a break. Um, so my advice, I when I went to get my undergraduate degree, I didn't really have a solid understanding of all the different types of science careers and topics and things that were available. So I would say start to talk to people and educate yourself about what's out there. Um, Honestly, I didn't know that Arabidopsis existed when I was a undergraduate student. And here I am now, you know, having spent the last five and a half years of my life working at the center. Um, and as much as possible, try to get some hands-on experience. So if you are thinking about plant sciences, try to get some hands-on experience in a lab or a greenhouse. If you're thinking about animal sciences, uh, look at different opportunities to get that hands-on experience um, so that you can really start to hone what your interest is um, and to build up your resume to show that you, you know, you started to learn the methods and the different things that you'll need to do. Chris, what would your advice be? Um, kind of similar along the same lines. Um, if you are exploring as far as like a degree options, um, if you're pursuing something, do kind of expand your view just a little bit. See what else is uh, like maybe a satellite off of what you're thinking, or if you're looking at something very specific, maybe just broaden your view just a little bit, um, because uh, just because you're focusing on one thing, it may not actually interact with a lot of other things. So you can, there's a chances there by just expanding just a little bit to see, okay, this, I want to primarily focus on this, but it can branch out to also be involved in certain other areas. So there's a lot of plant science, but it also can expand out and touch with like agriculture and crop science and things like that. Um, so there's a chance to have that interdisciplinary um, work between different areas that kind of overlap. So kind of look to explore those other options that where you could actually apply some of the things you learned in one area and apply it to something that may in a slightly different area. Emma, a specific question just came in for you. So I, I invite you to, if you have advice that you want to share, but I also want to make sure that this is addressed. It says, Emma mentioned work-life balance. How would you say university research relates to other professions in terms of work-life balance? So that's something that I've struggled with a little bit myself. I think it's definitely possible, depending on the environment that you're in, the, the department and the university that you're in, to um, to develop a good balance between work and life, but I think it'll be a life, it'll be lifelong work to do it. You'll always have to be, you know, working hard at maintaining that balance. One of the reasons why, you know, after getting a PhD, a lot of people will um, do postdoc positions, um, get on the tenure track to become a professor. And I personally chose not to do that because I felt that it, it wasn't compatible with the kind of family life that I wanted. And so I feel really fortunate that there, there was this opportunity to work um, in an environment where um, it's a little bit lower pressure. I'm not, you know, on the tenure track 
On the other hand, we are working on soft money, so it does involve grant writing, so it's some of the same stuff. So I'd say it's possible. Um, I don't have experience of working in industry, um, but friends that I know who work in industry, I think they, they struggle the same with work-life balance as, as people in the university. So potentially the university system is a little bit more friendly and there are, there are other options maybe if you look around that aren't the typical option that you would expect um, for a researcher going through a university path. Awesome, I think that's a great question. And I think it's more top of mind than it used to be um, within the field of science. Yeah. And I so think I it really can vary from institution to institution too. You can find departments and institutions that are really very supportive um, of maintaining that balance. And there are also situations that aren't as good. So I guess you just have to kind of be aware and be prepared to advocate for yourself and, and work on maintaining that balance. I think that advice could go um, both ways um, for the work-life balance and the advice for someone looking for science. Learn to advocate for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, we have one minute left. We just had um, a, a prompt come through for final thoughts for our high school audience. Um, I feel like I've shared my advice. Does anybody else have any final thoughts before we sign off today? I wanted to say that, you know, if you're interested in working in, in a laboratory environment, any lab experience is good experience. You know, all labs, at least all biology labs are, you know, using the same kinds of basic equipment. It's easy to translate from working in, you know, a, a plant lab to an animal lab. So if you have any opportunity to get in the lab and, and get working, an internship or, you know, a student position, any experience is good and very translatable to to other positions too. And just be really curious and, you know, seek out information about the things that you're that you're interested in. All right, great advice. So thank you everyone who's joined us today for our tour. Uh, once it is safe to be back in close proximity to other human beings, I uh, just wanna let you know, we do offer in-person tours for school groups or community groups. So. Hopefully sometime in the future, we can see some of you um, in person at one of our, our education events. So thank you. Well, I'd like to thank all of our speakers. Thank you, Courtney, Emma, and Chris for giving us that tour of your labs today and for sharing your uh, experiences with us. We greatly appreciate you taking part in our science festival and we hope you can join us again soon. And uh, we wanna thank all of our viewers for participating. We hope you enjoyed the program. We look forward to seeing you in our next event. Have a good day.